The Stormy Cohen prosecution brought by Alvin Bragg. We're going to learn everything we need to know about what's happening here. We're going to go through this quickly so we can get up to speed and be prepared for the trial. We know the star witness in this entire case is going to be Michael Cohen, someone who is a convicted perjurer. As we are going to learn, he is a critical part of this case. We also have Stormy Daniels. You know her and what her profession is, and she's going to be someone who's the subject of the contract that is at issue or of the payments that were at issue in this trial. And all of this is being led by, of course, Alvin Bragg. And so we're going to start with Alvin Bragg and learn a little bit more about him because Bragg is kind of just the figurehead. They kind of just shoved him out in here. He just got elected, took office in 2021. And now he's got to be in charge of this case, which they're accelerating because it's the last case in their arsenal that they have to go against Trump. They're running out of time in Florida. They are out of time on the J6 case. We'll see what the Supreme Court does there. And Fannie is in a lot of hot water still. So that case looks like it's going to be off the rails before November. So this is it. This is the only thing they have left. So let's talk about Alvin Bragg. Who is this guy? Well, you can see Alvin Bragg. He went to Harvard Law and he was on Harvard Law Review. And so it'd be very curious, I think, if someone did one of their you know analyses on Alvin Bragg to see if all of his law review articles were appropriately cited, you know, because he was on law review. He may have written a lot of articles and we know what kind of reputation Harvard has. So he was there on Harvard Law Review, citations needed on his work. 2003, he went to work for Attorney General Elliot Spitzer. We know what happened to him. Then in 2009, he went to become a U.S. attorney at the Southern District of New York. Also in New York, we've covered a lot of cases there. That was the Lawrence Kaplan case, also presiding over a Trump case in Eugene Carroll. 2017, Bragg went over to the Deputy AG's office in New York. He was suing Trump back then. So the reason we ask about prosecutors is because we want to know, are they unbiased? Are they partisan or nonpartisan? Are they prosecutorial hacks or not? So we're going to see going all the way back to 2017, before he was the DA of Manhattan, he was already going after Trump, right? So has a history of doing that. Then in 2021, he gets elected, takes office January, boom, he becomes the Manhattan DA. Now you've heard about Alvin Bragg and you've probably heard this idea that he is a Soros DA. Well, I would say that that is fact check true. Now you'll see other people People will say, no, not really. He just got money from Soros and he's not just a Soros guy, but you can follow the money and you can see here, George Soros gave a million dollars. This is from a New York Times article. George Soros, 1 million to a racial justice organization called the Color of Change. And then they gave $500,000 of that over to Alvin Bragg. And I believe that that money was actually earmarked in totality for Alvin Bragg, but they decided, well, we're an independent entity. So they just grifted their 500 grand off the top or whatever they did with the rest of it. But George Soros funding a lot of this stuff. And then this enabled Bragg to take office in 2021 and then have some issues with this case, right? The Trump prosecution that we're talking about here emanates from 2017 charges. So from a long time ago, and Bragg doesn't take office as the Manhattan DA until 2021, as we saw. So what happened to this case before it actually landed with Alvin Bragg? Well, we have an idea because before Bragg took office, you can see this date is July 18th, 2019. So this is before Bragg Bragg is in charge. We still have another prosecutor who's in the Manhattan DA's office. That other prosecutor who is not this guy is Cyrus Vance, who we're going to learn about next. But we're rewinding the clock. We're going to pre-Bragg, right? Where was this case before we even got here? So Bragg, not in office yet, but this is now kicking around with the federal government. So this guy's name is Jeffrey Berman. Jeffrey Berman, you can see former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. And more about this guy. He was the U.S. attorney in in 2019, he was actually appointed by Jeff Sessions. So some background on him. Appointed by Jeff Sessions back in 2018. There was a problem with him. Bill Barr said that he needed to go. In June 2020, he was ultimately fired and he was removed. So this guy was a little bit you know, difficult for the Trump administration. So it seems he would not leave. And so they asked him to leave. Then he did leave. So here is what they tell us, though, back in 2019. He is with the feds there in the Southern District of New York. Right now, Trump is being prosecuted by the state states, right, by the state of New York through Alvin Bragg. But we're asking ourselves, well, if Donald Trump is alleged to have given Stormy Daniels some money and that money was an illegal transfer or, you know, he was maneuvered through LLCs and through Michael Cohen's to Stormy Daniels, then that is a violation of federal election rules and whatever. So, okay, the feds should investigate that, right? We have a U.S. attorney called Jeffrey Berman who is doing exactly that. Here's what the New York Times reported. In 2019, they said federal prosecutors signaled in a court document that was released on Thursday that it was 
was unlikely that they would file additional charges in the so-called hush money investigation that ensnared members of Donald Trump's inner circle and that threatened to derail his presidency, right? So they couldn't do it. Why? Now, in the document, prosecutors said that they had, quote, effectively concluded their inquiry, which centered on payments made back during the campaign, allegedly to buy the silence of two women, that's Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal, who they said had affairs with Trump before they said they didn't, or at least Stormy Daniels said she didn't in her letter from 2018. So this guy was investigating, investigating. They ultimately come to the conclusion they can't do anything about this or something, right? We don't really know what it is. And we've heard from Michael Avenatti when he called into the Ari Melber show and he was explaining to him that they don't really know why, right? Even from his perspective, why this all came down because in 2018, Michael Avenatti wanted Trump prosecuted and he thought he had, you know, campaign finance violations and all sorts of stuff, but the feds couldn't figure it out from the Southern District of New York. And this is the other prosecutor who at the same time before Alvin Bragg came in was in charge in Manhattan. So this guy preceded Alvin Bragg. He was actually elected, his name is Cyrus, from 2010 to 2022. I think that's a mistake about 2021 because he was succeeded by Alvin Bragg. So forgive me on that typo there. But we have some interesting situation here because Cyrus Vance, you know, we're hearing like, oh, Stormy Daniels, hush money. This is illegal. And this is something that is unbecoming of a president. And Donald Trump has never acted so egregiously, no history of any president acting so monstrously. And so we have to go and prosecute him, which is the stupid line because this office has been, I would say, excusing and actually covering up evidence and faking evidence on behalf of actual criminals, right? We've got Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein, who are the two people we're talking about here. They act like they're maybe, you know, sex crimes warriors. Trump mislabeled some payments or something, and this is egregious, trying to interfere with the election. They are corrupt as can be, okay? In Jeffrey Epstein's case, click this link over here, and what we're going to find is that this woman, her name is Jennifer Gaffney. She was a senior prosecutor for this office. This is Cyrus Vance, the head prosecutor, the guy who is formerly the Alvin Bragg position. Jennifer Gaffney, the woman you see here next to Epstein, she is or was formerly deputy of sex crimes working for Cyrus Vance. And we had two situations with her. One, when Jeffrey Epstein was being sentenced, she argued for a deviation down, right? So she is a prosecutor. This is insane. Let's, in fact, click this article and see if we can follow through this one. Here is the background. Manhattan DA sided with Epstein, okay, after botching the investigation. So here's the background. The Manhattan DA's office, same one that we're talking about here, that once went to bat for a billionaire named Epstein after botching a review of his crimes and swallowing his lawyers claim that there were no victims here are, have now been released. Now here's the background. This assistant DA, her name is Jennifer Gaffney. She was then deputy chief for Cyrus Vance. She asked a Manhattan judge to downgrade, right? She went to Manhattan, asked a judge to downgrade his sex offender registry status. The judge was stunned. Why is the Manhattan DA here? The Manhattan Supreme Court justice called Ruth Pickholtz said, I've never seen the prosecutor's office do anything like this. What? I've done so many cases much less troubling than this one where prosecutors would never make a downward argument like this. Now, Gaffney from Cyrus's office admitted that she never spoke to the Florida U.S. attorney who handled this. And she said, well, the judge, I don't think you did much of an investigation here. I'm shocked. Why are you in my office here? Why are you in my courtroom demanding that he get a lesser penalty? DA's office insists, right? Cyrus Vance says, I was not aware of this. Vance spokesman said, our prosecutor made a mistake. Gaffney, same prosecutor, also working on Harvey Weinstein. Weird. Left the DA's office in September. She declined to comment. Now, you know, it's very unusual. They say there's no way that Vance didn't know. My point is, I'm sharing this with you. These people act like they are, you know, law and justice warriors or something. Like they have to get every spreadsheet row right. Every check needs to be appropriately designated, right? Give me a break, okay? They're partisan hacks. Their office went to bat for Jeffrey Epstein, as we just saw. And Jennifer Gaffney, the same woman, also under the direction of Cyrus Vance, was also involved in covering up evidence for a Weinstein victim, right? Here's a second member of the Harvey Weinstein prosecution team who quit the Manhattan DA's office last month over a controversy whether the lead investigator or the lead prosecutor covered up damaging evidence against an accuser, okay, against a victim. Veteran prosecutor Jennifer Gaffney, deputy of the sex crimes, was thrown a going away party after her corrupt career. Her party took place just one day after the second chair also left, as corrupt as we see like in Fulton County. It's a disaster DA's office. There's not justice going on. They're covering up for actual criminals like Weinstein, for Epstein, for these other people. And then they are, you know, turning around and saying now Trump is guilty of something that's essentially a spreadsheet 
crime. And they claim that they're purveyors of, you know, justice and fighting on behalf of Stormy and the people of New York. Give me a break. So we have some background there. This is this guy. Now, he also hired Mark Pomerantz, who we're going to learn about in a minute, to also come in and investigate Trump. And then in 2022, he didn't do anything with the case, right? He had many years. Remember, these are 2017 charges. So we now fast forward to about 2020. And now he doesn't do anything on this case either. Basically passes this whole thing off to somebody else. And that person is going to be Bragg. And that person, Bragg, we talked about. But remember, he also hired Mark Pomerantz. And so what I'm going to share with you is going to show how this case was rejected multiple times. Just to catch up, Southern District of New York through Jeffrey Berman has already rejected this. Okay, case already declined. Evidence is bad. Don't want it. Cyrus Vance sitting on this case. He doesn't do anything with it. He hires Mark Pomerantz. Mark Pomerantz is now involved with Alvin Bragg. This is Mark Pomerantz. You may remember him. We played some clips from him on our channel some time ago. He is the former Southern District of New York prosecutor, left back in the 80s, and then he went into private practice for a long period of time. He wrote this book after he left Alvin Bragg's office, but he was sworn in in February 2, 2021. So Mark Pomerantz comes in. He is now a special assistant prosecutor who is working for Alvin Bragg. Then he resigned, right, in anger, in fury. So he's there for about a year. He then resigned in February 2022 after Bragg comes sworn in. February 22nd, I believe, is the specific date on that. He leaves and is furious with Alvin Bragg, right? Can't believe you're not going to prosecute him, which is why he resigns. In fact, he wrote a resignation letter, and this is what he wrote in it on February 23rd. He says, you know, Alvin, I fear that your decision, Alvin, your decision, what decision? Does that mean that Alvin Bragg is not going to prosecute this case? Huh? So he just wins. He comes in. I can't believe this. I fear that your decision means that Mr. Trump will not be fully held accountable for his crimes. I have worked too hard as a lawyer and for too long now to become a passive participant in what I believe to be a grave failure of justice. Wow. I therefore resign from my position as the special assistant district attorney effective immediately, right? Mark Pomerantz is furious. He leaves, he grabs his ball, he goes home and he brings with him his partner who was also very against Trump from the beginning. This guy was Kerry Dunn. He was also a former Manhattan DA and he resigned at the same time. And why would they resign is because Trump is not being prosecuted. In fact, both of these guys, Pomerantz and Dunn, they left private practice. Basically, we're like volunteering for the DA's office, right? These guys are making a lot of money in private practice and they just decided we'll just leave and go prosecute Trump. So they go join the DA. He joined all the way back in 2017, was there for a while, fought and won, got copies of Trump's taxes at the Supreme Court. So in other words, had been on this case going against Trump, like joins in 2017, right after Trump takes off. Oh no, I gotta do something. Goes back, joins, and then has been waging a war against Trump ever since. Resigned also with Mark Pomerantz in February. And then now with Pomerantz, these guys have co-founded, I guess it's called the Free and Fair Litigation Group. Okay, so they're gonna come out and now organize to stop Trump and MAGA, all the things. That's Kerry Dunn and Mark Pomerantz. Now this guy, you've heard a lot about. Donald Trump has mentioned Matthew Colangelo many times, and you've heard his name brought up at rallies and speeches because he is a hatchet man for the left who has been following Trump around from the beginning. You see, this is what he looks like here. And he, very interestingly, has worked for everybody that you see on this screen. Okay, Obama, Tish, Stinky Bigfoot, who takes her shoes off in court, waddles around in court. We got Biden and Alvin Bragg. So Colangelo, he also went to Harvard Law. Someone might want to do a citation check on that. Obama deputy assistant, okay, before Trump came on the scene, he was over at the AG's office and was there for a while. Then he left Obama, right? So Obama leaves, Trump comes in, he joins Tish James. So he is there leading the charge in a number of different civil cases against Trump, going after Trump org and so on. And that opened up a lot of liability for guys like Weisselberg and so on. So then as soon as he's done with Tish and the Trump org stuff is he hands that off, Joe Biden comes back in and he becomes Joe Biden's acting associate AG at the DOJ. Guess what happens? Alvin Bragg decides he's not going to prosecute Donald Trump anymore. Oh no, the Bragg prosecution is going awry. What happens? Oh, Matthew Colangelo goes over there next. So we follow the bouncing ball. He goes from Obama, he goes to Tish, he goes over to Biden, then he goes back over to Alvin Bragg, and every single time he's prosecuting Trump. Here is how it looks 
on a timeline. Every which way he joins the Obama DOJ acting associate under Merrick Garland. This happened back on January 20th of 2021. So he did serve some time with Biden. And that's why we make the allegation that Biden sent him to go over and prosecute Trump, literally bouncing offices. Before that, he was working for Tish. And then on 12-5, right, we're going to put this all in a timeline of 2022, he joins Alvin Bragg's team. So every single one of these, he was prosecuting Trump, right? You can see how this works. It looks just like this with Trump in the middle. Colangelo waging war, a single individual focusing on Trump. Does this feel like fair and impartial justice to you? Does this feel like a prosecutor who is nonpartisan? Or does this feel like somebody with a vendetta who's made it literally their entire career, okay, to go after one person and to be enabled throughout the administrations, right? Now, you might say, okay, it's not even necessarily Biden who is orchestrating the prosecution. This guy goes all the way back to Obama, as we see here. So more Colangelo evidence. You see, this guy has been around in a lot of things. He was filing this February 10th, 2020. This was a case against Trump. You see Matthew Colangelo, chief counsel, writing on behalf of Tish James. Same thing here. Attorney General Tish announces a lawsuit over a public charge rule, August 20th, 2019. This case is being handled against Trump, Trump administration. Now, Trump's still in the office, right? He's still in the White House now. But guess who this is being led by? Chief counsel for federal initiatives, Matthew Colangelo. So he's just kind of like a sleeper cell. You know, they just kind of move him around from location to location to location. And so to recap how this is working, let's just hit the timeline, right? This is how the timeline works, starting off. And remember, before we even get here, okay, the charges started back in 2017. We're going to get to the charges in a second, but it was 2017, February, all the way through December. Payments, invoices, ledger entries were the basis of the charges. So they've had a long time. We're in 2024 now. Long time has elapsed and they're just squeezing it in before the statute of limitations on the felonies expire. So here is where we pick this up. First, we recall that there was a declination to prosecute. Jeffrey Berman, back on July 18th, as we discussed, declined federal charges. There was no violation here. Something happened. Alvin Bragg takes office. Dun, dun, dun. So it's already been declined once. He does a new and fresh review of the case. Do we think he is going to prosecute this case? Answer, no, he does not. He reviews the case, says Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels. What? These people are whack. We have no case here. This is going to be a disaster. So what happens? Mark Pomerantz and Carrie Dunn, they're out of here. They leave. They say, this is ridiculous. Trump's not going to be prosecuted. He writes that whiny letter. <laughs> Justice. Okay, bye, Mark. Have a nice life. So then Alvin Bragg starts catching a lot of pressure. We covered this here. He says, oh, no, no, no. That's not what I meant. I am, in fact, going to prosecute this. And so he gets cold feet. Something else happens. Guess what? Now we've had two declinations. The feds have declined. Alvin Bragg has declined. And let's not forget, before Alvin took office, Cyrus Vance sat on this case and was twiddling his thumbs, trying to just drag it out to kick it down the road until he could pass it off to some other new prosecutor. So that's three different prosecutors who have now declined this case, ultimately. And they've had years to bring it. So what happens? All of a sudden, boom, guess what? Matthew Colangelo joins the team, the guy we just talked about. December 12th, 2022, Pomerantz resigns in February. Fast forward to December, Matthew Colangelo joins the team. Guess where he came from? Oh yeah, the Biden administration from the DOJ. He comes, he brings a cattle prod, he straps Alvin Bragg to a chair and, you know, threatens to withhold breakfast from him. And then guess what? Boom, we get a grand jury is now suddenly impaneled. Grand jury starts considering these charges. We get an indictment on March 30th, 2023. See how quickly everything changes? And the actual indictment from the grand jury, Colangelo joins December 12th. We get like a month later, grand juries impaneled. They start to dig into it and boom, March 30th, they get the charges. Incredible how quickly that works, right? Dragging, 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 dragging. Biden's guy, Colangelo comes in. Boom, grand jury gets impaneled. Charges come up. Trump gets gagged because this thing gets scheduled for trial. Now Trump can't say anything. And we've got trial just over a year away from the indictment while they're still just dropping off additional discovery, hundreds of thousands of pages, one by one. And so that's the timeline. And I think when you lay it out like this, you can see exactly how corrupt it is. They delayed, they delayed multiple declinations. Joe Biden's hatchet man, Matthew Colangelo joins the team and boom, within you know a couple months, Bragg has been cattle prodded enough. He's like, all right, all right, I'll, I'll do it. Let's go. And then suddenly, 
finally, it all starts to come to fruition. Trial is scheduled, and of course, it's all based off a continual focused partisan prosecution led by people who've made it their career to prosecute him. So what are the charges in the Trump trial in New York? Let's dig into the indictment. You can see this is a screenshot from the indictment itself, and it tells us that the grand jury of the county of New York by this indictment accuses Trump of this crime. It's called falsifying business records in the first degree. It's a spreadsheet crime. It's a check crime, and it is in violation of New York law, section 175.1. Now, we're going to break down what this means and walk through it, but it's pretty simple. A business record is largely what it sounds like, and they're saying it was mislabeled, essentially, right? It was mischaracterized, and they did this for a whole slew of transactions. Let me show you what I mean. Here is a set of other excerpts from one batch of crimes. So you hear people on the left on MSNBC scream all the time, 34 felonies, rah. Okay, every felony is related to every single act. Each individual act is being teased out. We're getting very granular here. So Michael Cohen, as you can see from the indictment, wrote an invoice. Cohen sends an invoice, sends it over to Trump. Boom, that's a felony right there, one. Many people have received invoices, maybe even written invoices. So if you get an invoice, right, if you caused, according to Bragg, that invoice to be created, felony for you. Now, if that person, like your lawyer or whomever, sends you an invoice and you enter that invoice into a ledger, okay, put that into a spreadsheet, put that into your QuickBooks, write that into your checkbook, whatever, that's another felony. Oh, so if someone else sends you an invoice, you make a law. Oh, and then you say, well, I better log that. Don't want my bookkeeper to get mad at me. Put it in your records. And then felony number two, big trouble, man. How dare you? And then number three is you write a check and a check stub. So lawyer sends you an invoice. You put it into your log. You cut them a check to write the check back. Three felonies, easy as it can be. Now, this was only for February. So now you multiply that by a number of months, the invoice, the ledger, and the check. Felony, felony, felony. It's like Netflix on repeat, right? Every month, hey, three felonies, perfect. $5, oh, perfect. You know, send you the bill, it enters, you pay it. Three felonies times three. Now there was one month or two where there were two entries, there was a double payment in one month, there were two bills, so they consolidated two months, but that's how this is broken down. Now we have some of the checks that have been released. I'm not sure if all of the checks have been released, but I grabbed one of them to give us an idea of what's happening. And we have some questions to ask ourselves. What are business records? Where did the money come from? Did it come from Trump's personal account, his business account? Did Trump sign this from a business, you know, bank account or a personal bank account? And what's it referencing? You know, is this conducted in the ordinary course of business? So on and so forth. But you see, Trump was paying with checks and they're going to introduce this into evidence. This check, as we'll also note, is from 10-18-2017, which of course is when Trump was in the presidency, right? He was the actual president at that time. So it's $35,000 to Michael Cohen. And this was part of the monthly retainer, right? Every month he would send an invoice, get a ledger, get a check. And we'll talk about this, I'm sure a lot more as the trial unfolds. But how does this all work? Here is another diagram that we created here to give us a breakdown of what's happening. So again, Michael Cohen, he sent 11 invoices and every single one of those was a felony. So invoices go over into the ledger, Trump organization or somebody's entering these in. They're saying these are business entries. This is a business entry, business record, business record. There are 12 ledger entries and then there are 11 checks that went back out and every single check is a felony. Now, some of the checks were not signed by Trump. In fact, I think one was signed. It might've been by Don Jr. or Eric. I'm not clear on that, but one of the sons and definitely one was also signed by Weisselberg. So Weisselberg may have signed a check and you might say, well, maybe he's not guilty of those. The jury might say, well, he's only guilty of the ones he signed. So every single action is a business record that was falsified. Everyone's a felony. So the idea would be you just try to defend those, knock those off one at a time if you can't get them all done simultaneously. But Trump has already attempted and tried to say that they can't introduce evidence about official acts because he was the president. All of these entries came in from 2017 during 2017 when, of course, he was the president and the conduct were official acts. Was, these were things the president was doing. And so there's an immunity argument there that has been submitted and rejected. Now, a portion of the money, a portion of those checks that went back to Michael Cohen, he would then create an LLC and then Stormy would be settled out from those LLCs. And the question is, you know, first of all, what was the nature of like, these people are all liars. We got credibility about what's happening here and what Cohen did and where all this, you know, what the mechanics of this were and who's going to say what, but their credibility is quite bad. And there are questions about intent from this, from Trump to Cohen, right? What was the 
intent essentially of this check. And they're gonna say that they can infer Trump's intent or prove Trump's intent sufficient to a jury to say that he knew that these were erroneous entries that should have been chronicled differently and maybe not written off as a tax expenditure or something. We still don't know what his theory of this case is, but we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So some other notes about these payments, seven of these that we know of were $35,000. Some one other was for $70,000. Six were trying to sign by Trump himself, one signed by the son, one signed by Weisselberg. And so when we talk about the actual charges now, as we meant referenced, it's section 175.10, falsifying business records in the first degree. And this is a little bit you know, confusing because first degree incorporates second degree. So let's go to second degree first and talk about that and then work our way up. Because as you can see here, they say person is guilty of falsifying business records in the first degree when he commits the second degree. So we'll start there. It's second degree plus something. So what does the second degree say? Well, and they're going to have to prove this, right? So person is guilty in the second degree when they do one of the following and it's an or. So it's one or two or three or four. So let's see if we can get rid of some of these options. First one sounds like it's probably it makes or causes a false entry in business records of an enterprise. So then that gives us a little bit of defense, right? From a defense perspective, we say, okay, well, what is a business record exactly? Was the ledger a business record? Is an invoice a business record? Is a Trump check from a personal account a business record? Because each one of those was charged as a felony. So we got to look at the definitions and see. And were these of an enterprise? Like is the Trump Cohen relationship and check relationship an enterprise or is that private counsel? Is that just a counsel relationship? So right, these are elements, they're check boxes, got to check them off. So it's a false entry, something that's not true in the business records, another element of an enterprise. So Trump's defense will be attacking those and trying to undermine each one of those elements appropriately. So here, what about alters, erases, or destroys a true entry? I would say no, I don't think that's an issue in this case. No one destroyed anything. Omits to make a true entry. So like fails to write something in there that they should have. No, don't think that. How about prevents someone else from making an entry? No, I don't think that either. So Alvin Bragg is going to be relying on subsection one of second degree. And again, we're trying to break that. No, these are just transactions. Like, you know, I might hire a lawyer to do something, but I wouldn't call that a business record of an enterprise. That's just like me hiring some lawyer, right? So what are the definitions in New York? We're probably going to see a lot of that. And we'll see that, you know, pop up in the jury instructions. So Bragg needs to check, boom, false entry. Trump caused it to happen, right? He was the person who caused it to happen as another element and business records of an enterprise. So now all of that, but we're we're not in second degree, we need something. So we need something to aggravate this from second degree into first degree. Let's go back to first degree. So now that we know what that is, if you do that, but you do that when his intent to defraud includes an intent to commit another crime or to aid or conceal in the commission thereof. Now, so again, we got our four elements plus something. It's going to be having intent to commit another crime. Again, and this is, you know, got to be clear on this. It's intent to commit another crime crime. It's not that you did commit another crime. It's that you have intent to commit the crime. And it's not the intent of the crime, but it's your intent to do the thing, which is nuanced and a little bit difficult to you know, disambiguate. But they say that this is what kicks it into a felony, right? So if you have all of second degree plus the intent to commit another crime or to conceal the commission, that's enough. So let's see how that works. This is what Judge Mercon had to say when he was asking about intent. They said, as is clear from the plain reading of the statute, it is not necessary that Trump be even convicted of the other crime. Okay, we don't need to prove the other crime. We don't need to say whether it was likely he was gonna commit the other, nothing. It is his intent to commit those crimes that carries the day. So you're like, wait, what? So he had the intention to commit a crime in this case. And part of the elements of this case is that he also had the intent to commit another crime, right? So it's another element. He had intent to commit another crime. Okay, does that other crime have to be provable? No, does it have to be probable cause? No. Does it have to be? And nothing. It's just he intended to do it. Okay. And it's going to be a big, fat, broad standard as we're going to see. So the judge has already given us a framework on this. So when the trial starts, this is what we're going to be looking for. We saw that the statute tells us it is about an intent to commit another crime or to aid or conceal the commission thereof. So this is a little bit heavy lifting here, but what other crime? Okay. What other possible object crime could be the subject of the statute to make it in the first degree? You've got to have intent of another crime. So we have a couple of options. One, intent to violate the federal election law, right? Michael Cohen, he already pled guilty to making unlawful campaign contributions, which we'll talk about in part two of this journey where we're de 
debriefing what's happening here in this trial. So remember that the Southern District of New York has already declined this, as we've talked about. Jeffrey Berman said, nope, don't need to prosecute this. There's nothing here. Cyrus Vance, all the other people have not done anything with this case up until now. But they're saying that there doesn't need to be evidence that he actually violated this, just intent to violate it. So I don't know, you know how they're going to prove that, but they're going to say Michael Cohen, the judge wrote, Michael Cohen has already pleaded guilty on this thing. So that could be one angle. Now there's going to be defenses on this that I think the judge has already dismantled, but one defense would be that Cohen or that these crimes didn't happen geographically in New York, right? It's a federal crime that's not in their jurisdiction. And the judge has basically said that that doesn't matter. They can still rely on that. So in furtherance of the intent, the hypothetical intent to commit a federal election crime is one idea. The other is the intent to violate New York election law. So they'll say, well, you were going intending to commit federal law. And by intending to commit federal law, that means you intended to violate New York law, right? So it's like a waterfall. By intending to violate federal law, you also intend to violate New York law, which I think this is to save them, to give them some jurisdiction back. So we're following the bouncing ball. Like this is not normal in a criminal case. Obviously we have to like stretch yourself to make this happen. But conspiracy, they say you might also intend to violate New York election law, which makes it illegal to engage in a conspiracy to promote the election of a person through unlawful means. You can't get someone elected illegally. And if you're trying to do that by violating federal law, that's illegal. But they're not saying that Trump did violate it, just that he intended to, which is wild, right? So you have to really infer a lot there. And also intent to violate New York tax law, saying that they gave Michael Cohen more money, right? 35 times 12, whatever that is, it's like $400,000, $480,000. And so Cohen got paid, he was grossed up. They included the tax compensation in there. And under New York statutes, they say, you're not allowed to do that either. So these payments were conducted in order to give Cohen more money that was not earned. You're not allowed to do that in New York. And so that makes it a crime, right? And so those are the three ways that the judge, Mershon, basically gave them paint by numbers. Just make sure you put that in there. Intent to commit another crime element that will satisfy the five main elements. So Trump caused it. There was a false entry. There were business records. It was an enterprise. And we have another crime that was intended to have been committed. And any one of those three will matter. So when you see people saying, this kind of feels like a stretch, like it's not very clear, right? You know, you get a DUI. It's like, were you driving a car? And was your alcohol limit above the legal limit? Yes or no? Bop, bop. Here are the elements we proved. It's not like, did you intend to get in the car and then also intend for this to happen some other day? And maybe you did, maybe you didn't. It's very speculative because intent is hard to prove in the first place. And that's what the judge has articulated is allowable. So speaking of the judge, who is the judge? Juan Mercon, actually pronounced Mershon. We say Mercon because it kind of rhymes with Juan. Juan Mercon, it kind of has a cadence to it, but okay. It's Mershon. His daughter's name is Lauren. We'll learn about her too. He is an immigrant, came into the United States from Columbia at six years old, 1994, became the assistant DA in Manhattan. So where Alvin Bragg is working now. He then in 1999 became a New York State AG, worked for their office, was appointed by Michael Bloomberg to family court back in 2006. In 2009, he became appointed as the acting justice, which is his position right now. And again, just like the prosecutors, this guy has been highly involved in Trump cases. Weird. He always gets assigned to them. Strange. He presided over the Trump tax organization trial that we covered some here. He presided over the Alan Weisselberg trial, the CFO who was then convicted and has now been resentenced to prison as a perjurer because they're trying to shatter his credibility as the trial comes afoot because Michael Cohen is a terrible witness for them. So they think if they have one perjurer on their side, they'll just create an engineer, a perjurer on the other side, which is what we have, of course. And then in 2022, he is also right now presiding over a trial that is scheduled to go in May of this year. So case started in 2022. The Steve Bannon fundraising trial is scheduled to also start in May, provided that this trial is completed. So Judge Juan Mercon, we've learned about him. We know that he likes Democrats. He donated to Joe Biden and did that via Act Blue. And it was a total of $35. You can see Juan Mercon signing off on the internet, donating through Act Blue on two separate days. This one looks like 726, 2020. He's getting agitated. He's at 15 bucks on that day. 727, 2020, another 10 bucks. And then 727, another 10 bucks. So 15, 10, and 10. And he's just like, ah, that, shot, that, shot. and he's just donating very furiously over three days. And now we see he doesn't think that's a big problem at all, given the fact that his daughter literally works for Joe Biden, as we're about to see. And he's donating to Joe Biden. And he has an opportunity now 
to convict Joe Biden's political opponent. Isn't that nice? Isn't that interesting? So that is his donations. We also have more from him because he gave an interview to the media that is seemingly biased, not appropriate for a judge to do that. He says, you know, there's no agenda here. He went and sat down with the AP. Murkan wouldn't talk about the case last week, but he allowed that getting ready for the historic trial is intense. Really? How come? He says he's striving to make sure that I've done everything I could to be prepared and to make sure that we dispense justice, he said in an interview, emphasizing his confidence in his court staffers. He says there's no agenda here. Huh. Only people who have an agenda have to say that, right? We want to follow the law. We want justice to be done. That's all we want. Okay. So normal judges don't have to say that. We want justice to be done. Sounds like you're vouching for yourself. Oh no, we don't have an agenda. We want justice to be done. What does that mean? Should we just presume that? So why do you have to clarify? So in other words, it sounds like you might be defensive, like you're defending yourself because people are saying that you have an agenda. So you're defending yourself by saying there's no agenda. Some people are saying you're a partisan hack who's just trying to go get Trump. You're saying we just want justice to be done. Okay. So you're defending yourself. So you are speaking about this case. Huh? Weird. And you're speaking about the case to defend yourself against the criticisms from the Trump team. So you're biased, obviously. Next, we have the judge and his daughter, Lauren Mercan. We're familiar with her. She is a political activist who raises tens of millions of dollars for Democrats. And she's talked to her dad a lot about this case and about Donald Trump. Maybe not about this case. I can't say that, but definitely about Donald Trump because she was bringing it up on a podcast. And you see this photo came from these two. And I support a father and a daughter having a great relationship, obviously. Clearly, you want them to have a good relationship. And it would be insane if what his daughter was doing doing did not impact him, wouldn't it? It's your daughter. So if your daughter's entire career is being a Democrat operative, she is a co-owner of a company that this is their entire profession and her work is with your work. Isn't that conflicted? Don't you want your daughter to do well? And wouldn't it be a problem if you did something adversarial to your daughter by dismissing a hack prosecution case? Yeah, because she's fundraising off of it as we're going to see, but they have a nice relationship and that's why he needs to be recused because he does love his daughter as we would expect him to do. But as we know, Lauren explained to us that her dad does not like Donald Trump, especially when he is tweeting on the interwebs. He is very agitated when Trump starts mouthing off on the interwebs. And here is what that podcast sounded like. I'm curious to get your take on why digital in particular is a useful medium for candidates to convey authenticity. So I've actually had a couple conversations with my dad recently where he's kind of like, I hate that politicians use Twitter and like, it's so unprofessional. And you know, that's not how a politician should behave themselves. Themselves. And I explained that like, yeah, I think there are a lot of instances where it is not used and like when our president tweets anything that he thinks and like that's not what he should be using it for. But the pro is that candidates aren't sort of at the mercy of the traditional media anymore. And candidates like to go back to AOC can, even if they aren't getting the attention that they need or want, can get out there in another way. Hmm. Yeah, and AOC's amazing. Just Trump's a monster. Dad hates Trump, but AOC's incredible. We love her. Yay. All right. So here is some background on her Twitter. Now I grabbed this from Laura Loomer and this was posted on X, but this was a screenshot and a screen grab from what looks to be Lauren Mercon talking at campaign tech, some sort of, you know, digital campaign event, the evolution of future marketing and automation to chatbots and their future for campaigns, right? I remember when everybody was very excited about chatbots, install a chatbot and you don't have to talk to your clients anymore. And everyone's like, yeah, great. Our clients are terrible. And I was like, hey. So Lauren Mercon right there, authentic campaigns on the title and at Lauren M426 is the title. It's a nice grab. Campaign tech, that's the title, right? And so shout out to Laura Loomer where I saw this one. So that is, looks like it's her. Now, if you go over to that one, that same account, Lauren M426, uh-oh, she posted this one says, bye. Like one of those annoying chicks, you know, yeah. Oh gosh. She posted that on January 20th. It says Trump departs the White House for the last time as president. She also posted this one on Lauren M426. Trump should be in prison. Huh? You know who has the capability to do that, don't you? Her dad, literally. So Lauren wants Trump in prison. Now she ultimately changed that post and then deleted the account or something. But yeah, a little bit curious, isn't it? Now here's what she does. Lauren Mercon, the judge's daughter. So this was from some of the work she does from her featured clients. You see some of the worst people in America, Biden, Harris, United Nations, NRDC, Shifty Schiff for president, Michelle for mayor, Kamala is literally on the list, right? Kamala Harris, Biden.
Biden Harris. She's working for Joe. Her daddy is prosecuting Trump, daddy's opponent. All of these other people, Cory Booker, Governor Newsom, Whitmer, Hochul, all part of her enterprise. Now, this is also something she posted. She says, we wrote for Joe Biden, we reached 200,000 new undecideds with AI and digital media, and we engaged a bunch of people over there. And also said, for Adam Schiff, Authentic is the name of her company. HQ, writing for Pencil Neck Shift. We helped Adam Shifty raise a record-breaking $8 million in quarter two. That's from her company, Authentic HQ. We did a great job. And how do they make that money, you might wonder? Where does this raising money, where does this come from? How do they help Adam Schiff get $8 million? Well, they market the Trump prosecution. Isn't that interesting? You see, this is what Schiff did. This is a Facebook ad that her company runs. Authentic HQ creates these campaigns and it tells you to donate. That's how they make their money. And what is Shifty so excited about? Breaking news! Trump has been indicted. Can you donate now to help us defeat him and his MAGA movement? Defend our democracy from Act Blue. So the daughter is writing campaign advertisements for Schiff, focusing on Trump's prosecution, the same prosecution that her daddy is overseeing. And she's making millions of dollars on that. How do we know? Because these are the numbers. Schiff for Congress paid them 10 million. Senate PAC paid them a million. 115,000 for Lauren Underwood. Barbara Lee, software. Jeffries for Congress, $35, whatever that is. Shifty, another 4 million. Senate majority, 1.6 million. Is that the same one? Here's a new one. $29 million for different years. Yeah, these are different years. It's the same entities. So that was 14 million. That was 18 million, 14 million, and 29 million. That's her entity, authentic, getting paid for this crap. $93 million in total. And so you add all of that up and that's a pretty big problem. And if daddy decides to dismiss the case because it is illegitimate, daughter cannot write these campaign ads anymore. Daughter is suddenly screwed because the case has been dismissed and Shifty's campaign is now done. So lots of money being grifted on the back of this prosecution. And when Donald Trump decides to talk about it, guess what? Judge gags his butt. Says, okay, on April 1st, you can't talk about us. You can't talk about my family. Don't don't you talk about my daughter. Judge gagged Trump first go round. And then when everybody started to point all that out, that they were making 93 million, then they decided to also gag Trump from talking about family members as well. And when the public wants to dive into this, we don't get access either. You see the judge said, sorry, public access is denied. This case law is inapplicable and we have an absolute ban on trial. And so none of this is relevant and all papers are gonna continue to be published only as I see fit. And so nothing is accessible from Mercon. And so this is just part one of our discussion on who the people are involved in this prosecution. We're going to continue on with witnesses in part two, which will be covering Stormy Daniels, Michael Cohen, Karen McDougal, David Pecker, and all of the other people who we expect to see in the trial. And we're expected to also meet the Trump defense team. And so we'll be here covering that, my friends. Thank you for subscribing and joining us. Stay in tune for part two. That's coming up next.